as well as Trump continuing to hold rallies. And you see even on the Sunday shows and elsewhere, Republicans incapable of detaching themselves from the big lie. How does that all play into the reporting that you've done for your book, Peril? The committee has a lot of work to do and choices to make because our book shows that this was a pressure campaign in the days before January 6. Steve Bannon talking to President Trump on the phone, working with Rudy Giuliani, Dan Scavino, Mark Meadows inside the White House, Cash Patel over at the Pentagon. And there's still more of a story to be told. And we show that this was about trying to overthrow an election to prevent Biden from becoming president, not just having a protest outside the White House. If I remember correctly, we've already seen subpoenas just not responded to people not showing up close to Trump in, in uh, administration. For the January 6th attack on the Capitol, are we going to hear from people close to President Trump? Are they going to be compelled to testify? Well, the, the real question, Mika, is what does it mean to be compelled? Will this House Select Committee hold these people if they reject the subpoenas in inherent contempt? Congress rarely goes that far to try to maybe even have criminal or civil prosecution, fines, or perhaps even the last weapon in Congress's holster, which is jail time if someone does not comply with a subpoena. It takes a lot of steps to do that inside the House, but it is possible, hasn't been done in a long time. And the real question is, is if democracy is on the brink, and so many people in both parties, but especially on the Democratic side, who control the House believe it is, how far will they go to pursue answers on these important questions? Because as our book shows, which is cited in these subpoenas, this is not just some sporadic event. This was coordinated, this was sprawling, and the president at the top was involved. Hey, Robert, good morning. It's Jonathan Lemire. Anytime a politician goes to Iowa, we take notice, uh, and particularly this case, where Donald Trump drew about 20,000 people Saturday night for a rally, and Chuck Grassley, Iowa senator, was there, and more or less endorsing him and receiving an endorsement uh, in return. Uh, your book ends on a note of, no spoilers, uh, of warning that suggesting that Donald Trump may not be done with politics. And everything we've seen since then suggests that's the case. What's your latest that you've heard on other Republicans, how they're eyeing the race, whether they feel like Trump may or may not jump in? What's your state of the GOP as we start, start to think about 24? It's not just Senator Grassley, John, at age 88, as, as our book shows, it's Senator Lindsey Graham and so many others trying to rehabilitate President Trump. But President Trump is not changing at all. Our book shows at the end, Brad Parscale, his former campaign manager, says Trump wants an army back. That's what he's saying privately. And if he runs again, he wants this army to help him have vengeance on the entire American democratic system. And he's getting polling, saying the Republican Party is more with him than ever. That's the reality here in American politics. Trump is on the march in Iowa, oh and he's not going away. So uh, exactly to that point, as we approach the one-year anniversary of the 2020 election and the attack on the Capitol that followed, the senior reporter for The Washington Post, Aaron Blake, has compiled the top flip-flops by Republicans regarding former President Donald Trump's role in the insurrection. There's former Vice President Mike Pence, who initially said, quote, there's almost no idea more un-American than the notion that one person could choose the American president. Pence yeah. backpedaled this week, <clears throat> now saying the media is using, quote, one day in January to distract from the Biden administration's failed agenda and demean the character of the same people who wanted to hang him. There's South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham, who just hours after the insurrection claimed on the Senate floor he and Trump had, quote, a hell of a journey. But he was out. He's out. He's Lindsey out. is out. Since or as Lindsey said, no. I'm out. Since then, the former Trump critic turned loyalist, turned critic again, turned back loyalist, has I'm said busy. he hopes Trump runs in 2020. Say there's no future, no future for the Republican Party without DJT. And House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy. Also known as Steve. <laughs> reportedly had an ex expletive-laced phone call with the former president during the insurrection. Though he initially called for congressional action against Trump, he would soon after block 
A 9-11 style commission to investigate the attack on our democracy. Now McCarthy downplays his phone call with the former president saying Trump told him, quote, he'll put something out to make sure to stop this. And that's what he did. He put a video out later. Mm. And the Post gives the biggest flip flop to former U.N. ambassador Nikki Haley. Haley was one of Trump's loudest critics following the attack, saying in part, quote, he went down a path he shouldn't have and we shouldn't have followed him. We can't let that happen again. We can't let that happen again. I think that's a very good advice because, you know, if you have a, a president who is actually uh, in the middle of a conspiracy to commit sedition against the United States, you yeah, I'm thinking you probably just don't want to do that again if you now, want to be a functioning political party in a for the long term. new interview with the Wall Street Journal we discussed on the show last week, yep. she said, quote, we need Trump in the Republican Party. I okay, don't want us to go back to the days before <laughs> Trump. <laughs> oh, my God. OK, that's a flip flop. Um, uh, so anyway, their their political uh you know, it, it's going to be their political collab. Uh, Actually, anyway, it's going to hurt, hurt the what, country too. Well, it'll hurt the country too, but they're not going to—they're not going to win national elections. Maybe they'll because of, of uh, gerrymandering and because of all fear election history. Maybe Steve becomes the Speaker of the House again, uh, again for a couple of years. But that's uh, there is no long play in what they're doing. But no. then again, they're only thinking about the next two years. Uh, so. Uh, so, Mr. Costa, uh, let me ask you about uh, Donald Trump, uh, where he is, his standing in the party. Obviously, you've got politicians who are day traders and they're very nervous. They don't want Donald Trump to tweet a mean thing about them. It'll cause them to melt and dissolve. Uh, uh, but um, I saw the Pew poll last week. I'm sure you saw it, too, that is now saying about 44 percent of Republicans uh, want Donald Trump to run for re-election. Another 20, 25 percent say we don't want him to run for re-election, but would like somebody to run that will follow uh, his his uh, uh, some of his policies. But a, a, a third, one out of three Republicans say they don't want him to run again. They don't want him to be the future of the party. And, and these numbers, these numbers seem to be uh, it's been trending this way for quite some time. And when you get into a primary process, one out of three Republicans saying no to Donald Trump, that that creates a pretty big lane for somebody like Ron DeSantis or, um, I mean, hell, even Liz Cheney. If Liz is running against 20 uh, Trumpers, uh, she gets 15, 18 percent in the primary. Suddenly she's at the top of the heap. And it's a very important piece of data that some Republicans out there don't want him to necessarily come back. The problem is, and as Bob Woodward and I found in our chapter on Paul Ryan, Paul Ryan, the former House Speaker, believed Trump had narcissistic personality disorder. And one of the things he found out as he studied this informally is that if you clash with someone like Trump publicly, he lashes out. And so the challenge for the Republican Party, based on my reporting, is that even if they want someone else to be the standard bearer in 2024, are they going to be forced, whether Trump's running against them or on the sidelines, to endorse the lie that the election was stolen? And will this become a pervasive uh, box you have to check inside the GOP? And if it does, whether he runs or not, that shows Trump has power. Yeah, Bob, I find so few people uh, off the record want Donald Trump to run for re-election. They want, you know, the, uh, so many people want DeSantis to run for him, somebody that shares uh, sort of Trump's, uh, I don't know if he shares Trump's worldview, but he certainly has learned how to imitate Donald Trump effectively uh, in the governor's office and on the campaign trail. Are you finding the same, that, that people... Uh, even even Republicans who have been Trump loyalists for four years are saying he did his job. He put us back in power. He pushed the Democrats and the media back. But really, his time is done. He should play golf at Mar-a-Lago. And let's have DeSantis come in now and take the reins. There's the wish and then there's the reality, Joe, because our book shows right that Leader McConnell thinks that Trump's a fading brand and off the track thoroughbred doesn't want him to be dominant. But if you look at the reality President Trump and his allies are out there in these congressional primaries. If Republicans voted to impeach him in the House earlier this year, they're getting a significant challenge. Some of them are stepping away from even running for office. 
And it's becoming hard, even for someone like Glenn Youngkin in Virginia, a, a, a Republican from the business community, to distance themselves from Trump in a significant way in any way.